Welcome to the Timescales Interviews. I'm Grego, your host. This interview is being recorded in the United States and the United Kingdom. Today we have a very special guest, the extraordinary Bethany Weimers. Hello, Bethany. How are you today? Hi, I'm good. Thank you. Yes. Am I correct that you're currently located in England? Yeah, I'm in Oxford in England. Oxford. Um, okay. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's quite nice saying Oxford because people have actually heard of it because um, yeah. it's a famous city. Um, so, yeah, I'm in Oxford. So what's it like there today? Um, you know what? I haven't actually been outside today. No? Okay. Okay. Same here. <laughs> but I can see that it is, um, I think it's, it looks really gray out there, but I actually think it's, um, quite mild. It's not too bad. The weather there. You, you um, say it's looking, looking gray. Yeah. It looks gray, but I think uh -huh. it's, it's fine. It's, yeah. it looks like it's cold, but it's, I don't think it is. Uh, us, I've been busy us. working all day, so. So I okay. Yeah, yeah. So oh, so it's uh, I was gonna let the uh, listeners and 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 viewers know that the the time we're recording this, it's actually nine here in California. So uh, it's, and it's, it's getting... five o'clock here. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. I haven't been out today. That's terrible. Yeah. I shouldn't admit that. But, well, yeah. well, we haven't <laughs> either. But I've I've got some skylights here. I'm looking outside, and it is gray here also. Um, but it's not it's not because we're expecting a lot of rain. It doesn't really rain in California very much anymore. Uh -huh. And unfortunately, um, it, it's actually wildfire smoke. Um, oh, really? We have, yeah, we have a wildfire, uh, which is, I guess, 80, about 80 to 100 miles. Well, it's close enough to hear for us to to, to see the smoke. But oh. good news is we're supposed to be expecting some rain today, which we have not had for a while. So well, that's good. And but the wildfire, it's not really a terrible thing. It's something historically that has always happened in California. And uh, that's why our redwood trees have really thick bark, because it's oh. been happening, I guess, as long as people have been out here Uh the, the 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 key is to stay away from them <laughs> and you're so, far enough away now it's far yes, away yeah, yes absolutely it. yeah and we always have an evacuation route ready if something was to get oh, uh concerningly close <laughs> so <laughs> that's good <laughs> okay so um thank you for making yourself available for this interview that's absolutely awesome oh, um pleasure. and uh bethany is an uprising cultural icon and she exemplifies the very meaning of success uh, from atmospheric alt pop to directing Doctor Who for Big Finish. Uh, don't just take my word for it. Here are some quotes from big media. Bethany has been referred to as ethereal and enchanting by music in Oxford, a national treasure in the waiting. That's by a musical priority. She has this kind of intense, sexy PJ Harvey thing going on. That's from One Note Forever. And I, I did look up PJ Harvey after reading that. So <laughs> I, I'm, I'm getting that one. Okay. Um, an artist that sh we should all be getting excited about from Female First. All of these rave reviews can be found on BethanyWeimers.com. Uh, that's B E T H A N Y W E I M E R S dot com. And that link will also be shown at the end of this interview on the closing titles. I have personally listened to all of her music available online. I've bought it, I love it, and her music personally touches my soul in a way. Um, I've heard Pink Floyd songs that I don't care for. I like the most of them, okay, but every single song I've heard from Bethany, I love, and and I think that's really neat, um, and I can't believe I'm speaking with her now. That's, that's great. so nice, thank you. <laughs> that's honestly, it's really, when when people say they've been like a genuine connection to something you've created, it's really special, it's really nice, so thank you. Yeah, I appreciate my that a lot. Mm-hmm. Um, this quickly upcoming November of 2022, we're going to see a big finish Doctor Who release coming out, which is titled Doctor Who, The Seventh Doctor Adventures, Sullivan and Cross, 
AWOL. These two stories in part six star Christopher Naylor as Harry Sullivan and Eleanor Crooks as Naomi Cross and none other than Sylvester McCoy, who needs no introduction. And you directed these new stories. I mean, how exciting is that? And did you ever imagine that this would happen? No, I mean, no, <laughs> I wouldn't even have entered my head that this would happen. Um, so it, and it was just like a series of quite random events that led to me um, do, being in this situation. So, yeah, I would not have not have imagined at all hmm. that this would happen. Awesome. Can you tell us about your Doctor Who history and who is your doctor? Well, uh, so my Doctor Who history, I'm a child of the 1980s, so I watched Sylvester, basically, which is crazy because I've now directed him. <laughs> um, so my very first awareness of Doctor Who, is, I think, I'm still, I'm not 100% sure, but I'm pretty certain it would have been when the sixth Doctor turned into the seventh Doctor, and um, my mum liked watching Doctor Who, and she must have said to my sister and I that there was going to be something on television tonight that where there, there's this exciting thing happening and we were going to be allowed to watch it um and as in my mind I knew it was about this person changing into another person and I did not understand it at all and it sort of blew my mind a bit I don't remember watching it I don't remember it happening but that was my first awareness of Doctor Who and then I must have watched I must have watched it as a child because I've got some really strong, vivid memories of sitting, watching the Daleks in particular, being petrified. And just one particular memory where um, in the UK we have a thing called Bonfire Night. It's in November mm -hmm. and um, it's firework night, basically. And everybody goes out on cold November night to um, watch fireworks, basically. Um and we were going to be going to this. So I, was, I would have been about six, I think. Um, and before we went out, we were going to watch Doctor Who. So mm -hmm. in my mind, I've got this fireworks, Doctor Who. And I can even remember what we were eating. It's just it's been <laughs> stuck in my mind. Very time. memorable night. Very memorable. Um, and I think it was a Dalek episode because I've got that association, but I may be wrong. Um, and then, yeah, and then I watched, started watching it when the new series came out and avidly watched um, 9, 10 and 11 and then 12 and 13, completely inadvertently didn't watch so much because life got in the way. But mm -hmm. the great thing about now working for Big Finish is that it's kind of reignited my desire to watch Doctor Who. So I'm quite excited about getting stuck into the bits I've missed. Nice, nice. So you have you have some some enjoyment stored up for the future there. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now this uh, the bonfire night. I have actually heard of that before. Um, I'm not terribly familiar with England, but is that a nationwide event or is it regional? Well, it's nationwide. You know, well, definitely in England. I don't. That's a good question. Guess in Wales and Scotland they do it as well. You know, I actually okay. don't. I don't know the answer to that. So it's a from. It's from. Um, so it's called Guy Fawkes Night. Have you heard of? Uh -huh. this? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Do you yeah. know what it? Do you know what it's the, about? The, the, the crazy masks. Kind of. Yeah, I think that is probably something to do with it. Right. But that the story is basically there was a plot maybe four hundred years ago, three hundred, sixteen hundreds, I think. 1700s to blow up the houses of parliament mm -hmm. and destroy the government <laughs> um and they were caught and the leader was guy fox okay so um yeah i mean they were uh tried as traitors and okay. bad things happened to them and it's turned into a, it's quite messed up when you think about it is now a thing that we all go and celebrate together with the fireworks but it's not right um so the fireworks i guess it signifies the what would have happened if they'd blown up oh, the House okay. of Parliament. it's called the gunpowder plot as well right we have a little right. um 
We have a rhyme that goes, remember, remember the 5th of November, gunpowder, treason and plot. Yeah. And now I've heard it. that, but I don't know where. I'm I'm going to have to read up on that. Um, yeah. It's I've, very, I always forget that it is particular to England or Britain. I'm not sure. I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm going to look, look that up now, whether that's a thing in Scotland and Wales. And yeah, well. we we have a couple of things here that are that are uh, not exactly as history would want to lead us to believe. Uh, Christopher Columbus Day is one of them. That one's uh, mm. I, I think that's one we have that, that needs to go away. <laughs> um, but I, I've uh, I've always wanted to get a Guy Fox mask. I don't know why. I, <laughs> I don't know where I would wear it. I guess I could wear it for Halloween. For or Halloween. Something, but yeah, we've I've actually seen people on our streets here in in uh, the States wearing Guy Fox masks in the last couple of years because we've had a lot of uh, civil unrest. Yeah. Uh, and, and there's people, uh, I think COVID just pushed people, uh, to the brink of where they didn't really want to accept some things anymore that just really were not acceptable. And mm -hmm. we had a lot of public demonstrations and, um, I didn't really actively go to some of the demonstrations, but there were so many, I stumbled on them. And so I, I have seen people here in the States wearing Guy Fox masks in the last two years, mm. but it was for uh, disguising their, 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 their face. Yeah. Um, yeah. Cause so. it's, I think it go, I can't remember what the movement is that it goes with, but they are used by pretty sure by particular movement. Interesting. We'll both have to look this up. Well, yeah, we're going to have to. We yeah. Okay, boy, we got off on a strange, different tangent Very, direction yeah. right there. Okay. Yeah. All right. So we've covered uh, question number two. Um, just so viewers and listeners uh, do know, I want to remind everyone that I am reading this interview from paper, and I provided the questions to Bethany in advance. And the reason that uh, I believe that's a good way of doing an interview is that number one, it makes it to where I won't miss anything because I don't have a terribly good memory. And even though I can write five pages of questions, there's no way I could memorize them. So I, I'm not an actor. <laughs> um, and secondly, I think that by providing the questions to people that are being interviewed in advance, it gives them the ability to ponder upon what they would like to say. And I think it makes for a good interview. And in this case, we found a few questions that... Uh, that we probably didn't need uh, because they were redundant or or just not important. So so we're on to question number three now. This is this is this is something I'm really interested in here. Um, how exactly did you become a director for Big Finish? Did you sit down at a typewriter one day with a blank sheet of paper and write a letter to Big Finish that said, "I want to direct." Or was it more complicated than that? Uh, it was very um, just serendipitous is what I would, how I would mm. describe it. Mm. So I was at a studio um, in London directing something else entirely in totally different genre. Um, and it was in the spring, um, probably one of the first warm days of the spring. So it was a lovely day. I wanted to go outside at lunchtime. And there's one big table out there. So I went and I kind of gate crashed the table because it was pretty <laughs> full. <laughs> and mm. I just said to everyone, hi, what, what, are you what are you recording today? And the answer was Doctor Who. Oh, um, wow. So I awesome. started chatting to everyone. Yeah. And it, um, like I said, you know, that sounds really exciting. Um, it turns out the person I was chatting to was Jacob Dubman, which I, I thought he looked familiar, but okay. I didn't realize at the time. Mm -hmm. Um. And he introduced me to Nicholas Briggs, who is also at the table, but far at the other end. And um, yeah, I just went from there, I've chatted. Uh, and then I went along and I trailed Helen Goldwyn when she was directing, which was fantastic. I mean, like, to me, she was like, just the, the just top of her game directing these mm -hmm. audio dramas. So it was fantastic to see her in action and um so that's how I kind of was introduced to Big Finish and then um for this particular box set I, just, I had an email a few months ago um and asking if I'd like to do it um and originally Sam Clemens had been meant to direct 
Um, and then a clash came up with his schedule and he couldn't do it because he was directing okay. a film. Um, and mm -hmm. he very reluctantly had to pass on it. So, um, yeah, I was asked if I would like to uh, direct this box set, which was just, it, well, I, yeah. How, it was just how incredible. incredible. You yeah you talk about being in the right place at the right time and then and then another stroke of luck i know Maybe you should be buying a lottery ticket <laughs> <laughs> if only <laughs> you were um wow that is that is absolutely amazing so uh did you have to pinch yourself yeah i mean I, i'm still pinching myself okay but the, you know the amazing thing is that sometimes when you start working on something you think oh right no this feels so right and it feels like kind of the, I'm where this is the direction I want to be going in I, I I just enjoyed it so much it was yeah fantastic it was, it was meant to be meant to be yeah. wow <laughs> I I've, I've pre-ordered those stories by the way I can't oh, wait brilliant right. <laughs> okay so um so now that we have the initial Doctor Who uh, teasers covered, um, and we're going to come back to Doctor Who and Big Finish in a little bit, can we focus more on you? Um, please feel free to elaborate on who you are, uh, where you're from, uh, what drives you, and uh, what you love most. And uh, I believe that one of those things just might so happen to be music. <laughs> yeah, music is a huge <laughs> part of my life. Um, I learned piano and guitar as a, well I learned piano as a child and then taught myself guitar but the thing I always loved doing was making music mm -hmm. writing music um, so and songwriting so that's that was always a kind of hobby and then I tried to turn it into part-time career as well um, and yeah I just that's music is my thing um, but alongside that, I kind of love history. I love going out in nature. Um, and I've got a daughter as well. So you know, she's a huge part of my time and energy and life. So uh, what, would the, what was your last question about what I, what I love oh, what, most in life? Yeah, what, I would say my family. You? Okay, my family. there you go. Yeah. Being creative in my family. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> nice to have a little sidekick, huh? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so um how do you produce your music? Um uh, I always I always try to research people before I interview them and uh I do recall uh reading something I wish I had noted where I read this. Um I noted something about your music being self-produced, is that correct? Yeah, yeah, and I've, I've got a home studio set up so I can record at home um and I like the fact that that gives me the freedom to just explore in my own time the music mm -hmm. that I'm making I don't have to just go into a studio and have I'm not paying time to record so I can just be a bit more playful with what I'm creating and trying mm. things out I think I think that's so common now like right. 10 15 years ago people didn't have home studios so much but now mm -hmm. it's the norm really okay um didn't you just perform live on stage at the oxford canal festival very recently yes so that was um a gig i did yesterday and it was right. really nice <laughs> yeah it was lovely it was um a festival um just in oxford so it's a local festival but it felt it was just really hot just quite a wholesome festival it was yeah very really nice and it was lovely weather so it felt like the last last day of summer almost and um lovely audience it was great i really enjoyed it that must have been so much fun i uh when i uh found that you were going to be performing there i went and looked at the oxford canal festival uh website and it just looks it looks like paradise i mean it looks beautiful <laughs> out there everybody's having so much fun uh perfect weather it, it's uh it, it, it must have been just wonderful to be there. I wish I could see something like that. Um, all right. So here is a really broad question, but it occurred to me at some point uh, when I was trying to figure out the correct structure for this interview that instead of me breaking down your musical works one by one, that it would likely be better to just ask you to describe them 
And the elephant on the living room sofa, and we call it a couch here in California, by the way. Oh, I do too. Um, oh, you do too? Well, okay. Well, you're now an honorary Californian. <laughs> <laughs> um, it, it, that that uh, the, something that really is standing out right now is your soulful melodic masterpiece of circles. My oh. goodness. Can you oh, tell us you. about that? Well, it's a bit of a just like right some pieces of music take absolutely ages to create and I've been working on some stuff that it's just taken me it took me such a long time we're talking like years but it was partly because I just wanted to get the right sound but also it's quite hard to juggle a day job which is the directing myself and music career and being a parent so it, it was just hard to fit in um so Right. On the one hand, I've got stuff that's taken me years. I was last year, end of last year, I was finishing off recording some stuff for those and I just got distracted and I started playing the piano and um, I just started writing the song and the ideas of the, the themes in the song I've been thinking about for some time. So the ideas mm -hmm. have been brewing, mm -hmm. but it was just weird. It's just one of these songs that just kind of, came out really quickly um it sometimes happens like that you, know, you can spend months working on something and then another day is a couple of hours wow so, yeah that was wow. it. it was really quick wow i've uh i i've heard that uh well, I am actually not going to admit how many times I've listened to it. I've, oh. I like to, that's on my desktop. You know, oh, that's I, really I, nice. I, I, uh, I pop that on every once in a while as, as a pick me up. So, and I'm going to oh, listen to it really again nice. later today. That's really nice. Thank um, you. Yes. Um, I, I can't believe I'm actually talking to who created and performed <laughs> that. That's, it's, I, I, that is unbelievable to me. Okay. So, uh, me uh this is this is to the listeners um circles is easy to find online anyone can locate it just by going to google um type in circles by bethany weimers it's uh out there um i bought it i believe on bandcamp and i think it only took just a couple of clicks and you can listen to it on there uh download it instantly it's fast so go check out circles uh anyone who watches this interview you need to hear that Okay, so uh, Bethany, do you recall anything in particular that might have inspired you musically? I, I know you've touched on 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 learning piano at a young age, um, but do, do you recall anything in particular that might have inspired you musically? And if so, uh, how does that initial inspiration make you the success that you've found today? Um. So I think lots of musicians probably say this, that they can't remember not being into music, that it's ah. just always been a huge part. Um, so my my both my parents love music. My dad's his dad was always in the music industry. So um, in some form or other. So we always had music on in the house and my had new songs different artists that we were hearing um just a whole load of different genres and I was I've watched home movies recently and it's just there in the background constantly so mm -hmm. I think it was kind of inevitable that I was going to the, the the seed was always there for me already there that I that likes music and then I was surrounded by music so it just kind of grew from that very interesting um what were some of the the genres uh if you wouldn't mind mentioning well okay well i don't like classical stuff that i absolutely loved um anything a bit dramatic um uh -huh. pop stuff that was just on the radio often we just had the radio on uh 90s dance music that that was one of the things my dad was really involved in rave oh, music wow. basically wow nice um, yeah so i mean i don't think the age i was at the time i don't think most kids my age were listening to that um so uh what else blues music really got into the blues 
when I was about 10. John Lee Hooker was like my music idol. Um, mm -hmm. What else? Loads. But I can also remember loving things like Disney's Jungle Book right. and the music from that. Um, yeah. Like, just loads. overall, very, very wide variety. Yeah. yeah, I think, yeah. I think, you know, I think sometimes when you just love music, it's it's kind of, you like the tunes. Well, for me, I like the tunes. So I like the melodies. Yeah. So that's, well, I guess that was a big draw for me. You know, with you being a smashing success, uh, I have absolutely no doubt that there are going to be aspiring uh, younger people that are going to watch this at some point in the future. And um, that's really basically the whole intent of this current interview series. Um, there, these interviews are meant to approach successful people and find out keys uh, to their success and things things that led up to to them becoming so successful. And uh, taking that into consideration, um, with these young aspiring potential artists that will learn from you um not to put any pressure on you <laughs> um <laughs> what is the best advice that you can give um in someone wanting to enter the music industry based on your own experiences mm, this is a tricky one because i feel like the music industry has changed so much in the past 10 years mm -hmm. um so skipping over anything to do with how that side of it works basically like spotify algorithms that kind of stuff mm -hmm. the key thing for me is the idea that you're following your own vision um and just making good music um mm -hmm. and then second to that connecting that music to other people um sharing it um i don't really know I think the key thing is to kind of somehow have a community around you. I, I'd i say for me, the times I felt most um, like being carried along um, and getting to where I want to be, it's when I've been networking the most or um, just... Uh, yeah, I don't really know what to say for that one because it's a tricky okay. one. Okay. And 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 my take on that is that uh, things will probably change even more in the next 10 years. I think so. And it's because I'm not, I don't really like the state of where it is right now. I think it's mm -hmm. taken sort of, I mean, on one level, independent artists have can put stuff out there and it could, you know, it could go viral. It could... Be, it can be found by people all over the world. 20 years ago, that was not going to happen. Right. So, right. you know, that is amazing that that's now a thing that that can, um, that you can put music out there without being on a major label. That's that's mm -hmm. fantastic. Um, the downside to it is um, what what kind of gets onto, how, how the algorithms work, basically. I'm not, you need to speak to like a, spotify expert to know how they all work but right. just the whole thing to me just feels a little cold and it's not really it's a yeah i'm sure people someone coming into the music industry now probably has a better grasp on all of that than i do because i've been making music in this crossover time and it's changed mm -hmm. i think mm -hmm. okay on a positive note get out there play gigs that's the play gigs, make music, share it with people. Okay. Get good okay, at what you do. Good. Okay. <laughs> very good. Um, you just used a term I've never heard before, a Spotify algorithm. What is that? Oh, God. <laughs> do, do I not want to know? <laughs> it's how uh, social media works as well. So basically, if kind of the more plays you get on Spotify, the more that will spiral the more you'll get because it will say oh some people like this let's okay kind of suggest it to other people and it also will go with um uh kind of if you, uh, so for example on my spotify i might have liked say my favorite artist agnes obel so i recommend mm -hmm. everybody she's fantastic um 
Um, I'm sorry, who was that? Uh, An Agnes Obel, A-G-N-E-S, O-B-E-L. Okay, thank you. I have something else to look yeah. at this afternoon. Yeah, I absolutely <laughs> love her music. So um, if I listened only to her, I might then get recommendations for other music that's like her. Right. So that's kind okay. of how the idea of how an algorithm would work. Okay, so that's that's sort of the same as a Twitter algorithm where yeah, um, if thing. you like if you're following Doctor Who and yeah. then um, I think all it takes I, I've been paying attention to this recently because I think it's interesting. I think all it takes is for 100 people to click likes on a certain topic. And that's what says that it's trending because that's happened ah. with. Yeah, it's happened with Tom Baker twice in the last couple of weeks. And it always scares me. Because Mr. Baker's at the yeah. age and he's my doctor. And I don't really want to get on Twitter and go, oh, my God, Tom Baker is trending. What mm. <laughs> what could that be about? Um, but I think it's 100 likes. That That's what it that's seems like. So, yeah, yeah. 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 And they'll probably change that tomorrow. Um, <laughs> okay, so uh, the next part of this, let's see here. Did I skip anything? Nope, I did not. Okay, so let's get back to this whole Doctor Who thing. Uh, I think there's going to be some people interested in this. Um, and I'm going to give out a huge, massive spoiler right now because I know that you can't. <laughs> <laughs> Daleks. Okay, that's right. The upcoming November Big Finish release has already stated on their own website what the titles of the stories are. So no, we are not releasing spoilers. But... Uh, I see that the uh, you worked on two individual stories. One of them is four parts. One of them is two parts. Um, the first story is titled London Orbital or London Orbital. I have trouble with that word for some reason. London Orbital by John Dorney, uh, one of my favorite authors, and that's four parts. Uh, and then the next story is titled Scream of the Daleks by Lisa McMullen, another great author that I like. Um, and what was it like working on stories that were written by these exceptionally talented Doctor Who authors? Um, fantastic. I mean, from the moment <laughs> I got the scripts, I was reading them and I, I couldn't stop. I just got the script. <laughs> um, so it's been a bit of a privilege really to be part of that and to help bring them to life. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. Great. Both of the stories I have that I think they're really good. I think they're great. I, I can't wait for everybody to hear them. Nice. Okay. And they're available for pre-order right now. Uh, oh, yeah. Yeah. People don't have to wait. Uh, they can go to bigfinish.com right now and uh, look at the November releases. There's a tab up at the top that says what's new. Uh, with this being September, click on move to the right twice and you'll have November and it's it's right there. And, and uh, you can order it on a CD box set or uh, for really fast download directly from the site when that comes out. Um, did you happen to get to watch Nicholas Briggs doing the voice of the Daleks? <laughs> well, kind of. Um, so he, he was actually remote from another studio. So. Mm -hmm. I was there listening, but I didn't actually see him. Um, but yeah, it was, I didn't realize that it was going to be recorded with the effects on his voice. And the mm -hmm. first time I heard it, I, was like, I, I, I had chills. Oh, it, it made it, was, it real, huh? Uh, yeah. <laughs> it, and there were, there were moments where, yeah. Wow. How it was, awesome. It was awesome. Okay. Speaking of famous actors, uh, what was it like working with Sylvester McCoy? I mean, the doctor himself, uh, along with Christopher Naylor as Harry Sullivan and uh, Eleanor Crooks as Naomi Cross. Uh, did you ever expect to be working with these famous people? No, no. <laughs> I mean, but well, first of all, they're just really nice people. And I think that mm -hmm. is the that's kind of the overriding thing when you're working with someone is like getting on with them and mm -hmm. they're friendly, they're fun to work with. Um, so you kind of quickly forget that, Oh, hang on. You're, you're Sylvester McCoy. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, 
yeah they were all great to work with and the really good thing about coming onto a project where those characters their characters are all really well established kind of one aspect of the directing is already done because you're not having to um sort of focus on character development it that the, they know who they are mm. they know who the doctor is they know who um harry and um naomi are so right yeah that's already the part of it's already done wow have you ever considered doing uh directing or voice performances or anything like that for the bbc or for bbc audio or would you like to Yes, I mean, that would be amazing. <laughs> <laughs> I don't do voice performance, but because um, I'm not an actor, but um, yeah, I'd love to direct stuff. And I used to work at the BBC actually in um, in their radio archives. And here's a, a nice little bit of information people might like. So I was working on a project that was transferring all the old radio archives from tape, gramophone record, whatever it was on to mm -hmm. be digital so it could all go online and the rooms that were used for these were basically the radiophonic workshop which oh, some of wow. you listeners may know is where the doctor who original doctor who theme tune was created and so the room i went to was the room where it was made are you serious yeah what? and it sounds so it's like it was not glamorous at all it was like a like it's just a room, <laughs> but it yeah. was, had history. <laughs> but this is where Delia Derbyshire yeah. and Ron Grainer yeah. pieced that together yeah. way back in the 60s. Wow. Yeah. And you were you were yeah. in that room. It's still there. Yeah. I mean, the room, I don't know if it's still there now, but the, the um all the everything inside the room had changed because it was it had a different purpose, but the actual so the build the building it was in and the actual rooms I was working in between they were the radiophonic workshop okay that's really interesting that's that's fascinating mm. um that uh brings so many questions into my brain right now <laughs> i uh the yeah I, I don't even know that you could answer something like this but when you looked when, when you were doing this transfer process basically preserving history digitizing mm. it Mm -hmm. uh, removing it from magnetic media, which is vol much more volatile. Uh, well, I guess if you're taking it off of a tape and putting it on a hard drive, it's still on magnetic media. But yeah, but, yeah um, but uh, and I don't know that storing something on uh, memory is any safer these days. But the, the future will have something that is safe yeah, for long term yeah, storage. Yeah. But um, was there any possibility of finding lost things? And, I, and I'm not talking about the lost TV episodes, because I think anybody that has, has looked into that enough should know that those would not have likely been found in a location like that. But um, lost old tapes of, of things that, that so were related to Doctor I, Who? Um, everything I worked on was audio. So there was mm -hmm. no, I wasn't in the television bit. Um I don't know. I think when we got stuff, by the time I got anything, it would have someone would have looked up the information about it, so they would have known whether it was some kind of hidden, lost thing. Um, I don't remember ever. I don't remember anyone ever transferring something and then going, "Oh my God, what's this?" As in, <laughs> it didn't say it on the box. But okay. it could have happened. It could have happened yeah. <laughs> at another time. I could have been, but you know, I did get to listen to some pretty amazing thing, historical things. That, wow. And I think some of them might be on, I think there might be an archive online now. I'm not quite sure. Um, there is a series uh on CD, which I I hope I get this name right. I think it's called BBC at the Radiophonic Workshop or something okay. like that uh uh i'm i'm going to i'm going to have to look that up my i'm drawing a blank right now but it was it was a whole bunch of uh old recordings uh okay that's boy i that's that that's that's a bummer that i can't think of that right now it, it's i think there's six or seven cds in the series mm. uh, uh you know what as we're talking i i think i may remember that and, okay. and maybe we'll come back to that okay. okay um now one thing that i have learned in interviewing authors 
this seems to be consistent and it may be consistent uh, industry wide um, that uh, there, there's a there's a less than fortunate thing which is called rejection. Um, and I, I guess anybody in in a creative standpoint has probably had to deal with the rejection because I don't see it being normal for someone to be automatically successful and for that trend to just continue with a Midas touch where everything they touched turns to gold. I, I don't believe that that's reality. So um, I have to ask you, uh, if you don't mind, um, have you ever had to deal with rejection of any of your works? And if so, how did you deal with that? Well, you know, like like you say, it's part and parcel of being a creative and putting art out into the world. Um, I think there's two sides to it. There's the side of, um, I think when you're starting out, it's I found it really hard because, you know, it's quite a big thing to share stuff. And if someone says something mean about it, I'm thinking about the thinking about reviews of things when I just started out. I know I can remember just not being able to hold back the tears because it's feels wow. like a personal attack and you feel a bit like oh, what I've done is really rubbish. Yeah. But but I think you quickly deal with it. You, you put it to one side and think, OK, right either someone just doesn't like it or is there something I can learn from this? Um, what is it that is perhaps not working that made someone think this? Um, mm -hmm. And I think as you, the more and more you do, I kind of now feel like I'm at the point where I will either, um, it's a similar thing. It's just that that balance of working out whether whether to listen to what someone's saying, I guess. Right. You're always right. no you're never going to have something that everybody likes you're yeah, always yeah. going to have some yeah. even if it's i don't know someone someone who is an artist who is like viewed as i don't know let's talk about david bowie okay i love david bowie we all Same here. hold him in high esteem well most people hold him in high esteem but there's going to be mm -hmm. people who like, just don't get it or just listen to something and think that's right rubbish i don't want to hear it um so you know it's just you can't please everybody you can learn but you can learn from what people say if you want to uh, I think you just have to take it with a pinch of salt okay. and get on with it yeah <laughs> yes. okay I can kind of relate to that uh, um, I tend to be a nervous person and a little bit shy and after I did a couple of these interviews there were some uh mean people online mm -hmm. And and it it was it was upsetting, uh, but I, I guess you just have to learn, like you said, take over the pinch of salt, and 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 get past it. Very very good advice. Uh, yeah, I mean it's really hard, especially online, because I think people can hide behind the fact that they're not face to face. And yes, yes, and that's that's a big really problem hurtful. right there. People, yeah, people forget that it's real people. I right. guess the key thing is you're doing when we're making art, we're doing it because we, we love it and there's something we want to share with people. Um, and I think one of the reasons that I've taken a while making my recent stuff is because I don't want to put something out that I'm actually not totally happy with because kind of for me, what's the point? I've spent so long doing it. I might as well actually be happy with it. Right. Um, but also there's an element of thinking if I've done my absolute best and I know that this is what I how I want it to sound I don't care at all what feedback I get <laughs> because I've go. done the best I can there you go. and I'm 100% happy with it um as 100 well I think you're never going to be happy with absolutely everything but you know as happy as you can be with something yeah now you're talking about the seven-year gap between uh uh, you know what I hope yeah. I did not miss a question here because I was meaning to ask you uh about your previous album uh oh, Hops i think Road. i might have yeah yes well, yes yes about, how yeah, did we so miss wrote, that well that's okay we'll just talk about it now i so okay. i i've been playing gigs for a long time and 
making my little bits of music and selling them my homemade CDs and then I decided uh to make an album and I released it 10 years ago it right. took me like a year to make and I did that in my home studio um and yeah it was just a really for me it was a really important thing to have done that I made it how at the time I wanted it to sound I mixed it how I wanted to mix it now listening back I would change things the mixing is not amazing the um productions that would change things but I did it with basically zero budget and um (laughs) self-produced (laughs) self-produced yeah I mean I paid for mastering I I bought I had I paid for equipment to record stuff and I paid for the mastering which is what happens at the end of um it's like the last process um and that was it um yeah so that came yeah I released that 10 years ago um and then uh recorded uh released a couple of singles maybe it was one single and kind of set about making my second album and I just wasn't happy with what I was doing which is why why it's taking so long and then life got in the way (laughs) right there was a single from harpsichord row oh no there's also yeah there's also uh, a winter christmas single i did called winter heart yes yes which uh my husband and i made a video for we made a stop motion video Um, really yeah it's on youtube okay all right i'm gonna gonna check wait wait until december when you're starting to feel a bit wintry and festive and it's um (laughs) yeah it's i guess we're on california it doesn't get cold but um, (laughs) right well well, it does it does for about six weeks now (laughs) (laughs) wow i just i cannot believe we almost overlooked harpsichord row and the thing is i must have made a mistake because i don't actually see it referenced in the questions so it must have just been in my head. I thought that oh, <laughs> I well, thought that I is. had it in. <laughs> okay. So oh, here it is. Question six A. We skipped it. Can you tell it. us more about your prior musical works, such as Harpsichord Row, yeah. which I have and I love? Yeah. Okay. So right. there we go. Got <laughs> Thank it. You. Thank you. <laughs> and we Eliz- did it. Elizabeth Sladen. Uh, Elizabeth Sladen is the uh, the uh, person I was trying to remember who did the uh, CDs, which I think was called Doctor Who at the uh, Radiophonic Workshop. She was a host. She was a Ah. host uh, for that in, I think, the first half a dozen or so. And it was a huge amount of radio recordings. I mean, these things were hours long. Mm. Um, So is it possible that some of the recordings or transfers that you did in the radiophonic workshop could have been for those? No, because um, I I would have remembered <clears throat> if I transferred anything to do with Doctor Who, I would have oh, remembered. Oh, okay. So, okay. Yeah, no, I mean, the kind of stuff we transferred was anything from... I remember transferring um, a gramophone record that had been recorded at the liberation of a concentration camp in the second mm-hmm. world war which was harrowing but like utterly amazing to be listening to mm. um and then so from things like that to uh john peel do you have i don't know whether it, i've heard, heard of, of the it. name but i don't right now recall right the, so he's the, the um he was a bbc he was a radio dj in for a long time but he kind of pioneered um new music and interesting music and he was like uh he's kind of a bit of a cultural icon um Mm -hmm. and um yeah so john peel sessions so you might hear like like i might have transferred an early session from some band who then became really big that kind of thing um and then also like classic serials audio dramas just loads of stuff wow very interesting okay um the uh 
this question here, I, I don't know that you can answer this, uh, but I'm going to ask it anyway, and you have already seen it. So that's, I, I believe that's fair. Um, do you plan on or at least desire to do more work with Big Finish? I mean, yeah. It kind you of goes without you saying. You can just shake your head yes it if goes you want to, saying, and that's okay. <laughs> yes, I want to, and hopefully I am, but yeah, okay. just watch this space, yeah. <laughs> all righty, gotcha. Thank you. <laughs> um, as we all know, Doctor Who is going to be back on TV soon, and the uh, Jodie Whittaker era is going to be wrapping up, and we all know that there's a new Doctor that's going to be performed by the talented Shuti Gatwa, um, and I, first time I saw his name, I thought it said Cutie because I didn't know how it was pronounced. It was just in text on the screen. So, and he is cute. So I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to continue coining that and I'm going to call Shuti cutie. So, <laughs> um, so we're going to have a new doctor uh, and it looks like we've got some TV specials coming up here soon. We just learned the title, the power of the doctor for the next one. Um, and uh, I I've watched uh, Shuti and a couple of episodes of uh, sex education um, I haven't binge watched the whole thing yet. Uh, I, I may do that, but I'm, I'm excited. He's an ex exceptionally talented uh, performer. And uh, it looks like we've got some good days coming ahead of Doctor Who. So I guess you need to get caught up with 10, 12 and 13 real quick. <laughs> yeah. now, now we're going to have 14. So are you, are you excited about the new uh, the, the, the actually, changes? Yeah, I think the casting's a really good move. I think it's probably going to bring new audiences. Mm -hmm. um I, i'm i was instantly excited that when i saw who they'd cast uh, and even if i wasn't working on these big finish things i think i would um probably have it would just it would have re-sparked my curiosity to go and watch um mm -hmm. but yeah yeah it looks good, great good day good yeah. days coming up okay so um what is let, I, we're gonna we're gonna wrap up here. It looks like it looks like we're running at about an hour, and your time is very much appreciated. I I know that you uh, you uh, are going to really be interesting for people to watch. People are gonna love this. Oh, thank uh, you. So uh, let's wrap it up with uh, this this pretty general question here. Um, what is your best advice? And you've already touched on this a little bit in music. Uh, what's your your best advice that you can give to any young or uh, aspiring uh, directors, possibly people that may want to direct something based on your own experience. Well, it is interesting because I think my route to this place, the place I'm at now is probably quite different to other people. I'm not, I know a lot of people come from an acting background or may have directed theater before but I haven't. So my background I was music first, then audio, then directing audio, but in kind of a different genre. So directing voiceovers for various other things, which I did for like eight years or so, and then um, moving towards dramas. Um, I guess, I guess what we'll probably all have in common, anyone directing an audio drama is probably a love of storytelling and that's I guess that is like an innate thing for me I love stories I love one of my favorite things to do <laughs> this isn't really advice for anyone one <laughs> of my favorite things is doing something quite menial at home like washing up or cleaning or I love I actually like sewing stuff so sewing some something listening to an audio drama and mm. it's like quite a it's quite um that's like my comfort time <laughs> right it's right yeah um so i guess doing what you love basically yeah that makes sense that makes yeah. sense and, and and it's that seems to be a a a very common uh thread there yeah. um so okay all right so was there any questions that I didn't answer or that I didn't ask that you'd like to answer? <laughs> oh, uh, not off the top of my head. No. <laughs> okay. Okay. Well, if you think of one, let me know and we'll, we'll, we'll add on to this if, if you want to. <laughs> so, okay. okay. All right. So in closing, uh, we're going to conclude this interview with the masterful Bethany Weimers. 
Um, please do go out and order her music. It's really easy to find. We're going to put the URL right here at the end. Um, and definitely order her Doctor Who Big Finish uh, directorial debut. Uh, support her and reward her for her talents and her contributions to the things that we love. Um, that also is very easy to find. Just go to bigfinish.com. Uh, and as mentioned earlier, the upcoming Big Finish set of stories is titled Doctor Who, The Seventh Doctor Adventures, Sullivan and Cross, AWOL. And that's at bigfinish.com. And do be certain to visit Bethany's website, bethanywimers.com. Um, that's also going to be in text format here on the closing card. And finally, thank you kindly, Bethany. Um, this has been a sheer honor to speak with you, and I mean that. Uh, thank you very much for your time. Um, I will never forget being able to interview you, and I consider that to be a lifelong treasure. Thank you. Oh, bless you. Thank you so much. It's been <laughs> lovely being time. interviewed. <laughs> thank you so much. You're so kind, and have a nice evening. Thank you. You too. Okay. Okay.